so the next presentation we have is going to be uh, powering linked open data applications with Fedora and Islandora Claw. This is going to be a presentation by David Wilcox of DuraSpace. All right, uh, so hi everyone, uh, I'm David Wilcox. Uh, I work with DuraSpace as the product manager for Fedora. Uh, and if you're not familiar, let me, there we go. Uh, if you're not familiar with DuraSpace, uh, we are a not-for-profit organization. Uh, so we are all distributed. Uh, we are mission-driven, we're focused on trying to uh, help preserve and provide access to uh, our collective digital heritage, whether that is uh, scientific data or cultural heritage uh, or anything in between, really. Um, and we steward a number of open source technologies. Uh, you may be familiar with some of these. Uh, the focus today is Fedora, but um, uh, DSpace is quite well known and, and used uh, around the world. Uh, Vivo, perhaps somewhat less well known, although uh, it tends to be well represented at this event. Uh, I was here last year uh, and heard a, a number of talks that, that referenced Vivo. Um, it is a, uh, an application for uh, tracking and showcasing scholarship uh, at an institution, um, has things like researcher profiles and uh, uh, showcasing uh, applications and, and uh, things like that. Uh, and DuraCloud is, is um, for uh, uh, cloud-based preservation. So these are all kind of community-supported open source solutions. Uh, not the focus of today's presentation, but uh, I'm happy to um, uh, talk to any of you after if you have questions about any of these. Um, so this is also not really a uh, standard what is Fedora presentation, but just to provide a little bit of context uh, for those of you that might be less familiar with uh, Fedora as an application, uh, I'm talking here about the repository software. There's always confusion uh, because there is also a uh, more well-known Fedora uh, uh, Linux distribution. Uh, that's not what I'm talking about, so uh, just for clarity, uh, this is about the repository software. Uh, so, you know, basically Fedora is for storing and pre preserving and providing access to digital objects. Uh, one of the main things it provides is flexibility uh, for modeling your data uh, any way that you choose. And a lot of flexibility uh, really is uh, uh, delivered by uh, this focus on semantic relationships on, on RDF, and, and so that's um, kind of what I wanted to uh, focus on here today. Um, there is, of course, uh, support for millions of resources. Um, and uh, another topic, which uh, I guess is related uh, somewhat to the keynote here, uh, is uh, this focus on interoperability. So just the idea that uh, Fedora is not intended to be a sort of all-in-one solution. Uh, it is intended to fit within an ecosystem of other uh, applications and services. Um, so this is just a very high-level sketch, but this is meant to illustrate how we see Fedora fitting in with some of the other things that you all might be using at your institutions. Uh, so Fedora itself, uh, represented by this little green can in the corner, uh, is uh, basically, it, it, it's a repository, but it's also a linked data server, and I'll talk more about that, but everything in Fedora is either, well, everything is a web resource, and those resources are either containers, so they're composed of RDF, uh, or they are binary resources, your uh, PDFs, video files, et cetera. Um, you can store stuff in Fedora, but you can also store things externally, uh, so that's supported. And there are two primary integration mechanisms. One is through the API. I'll talk a little bit about that. That's where you would sort of integrate things like a website for displaying your content, or if you're using a, a, an image server, like uh, the International Image Interoperability Framework, IIIF, um, or if you were using something like Vivo, um, all of that stuff would sort of plug in through the API, as well as uh, you know, importing and exporting data, which is supported. You can serialize out all the content in um, standard RDF formats. Um, there is also a messaging feature, so whenever you make a change in the repository, it emits a message, uh, and there is a framework for receiving those messages and doing things like uh, indexing to an external triple store, but uh, I'll speak more about that uh, uh, in a bit. <clears throat> 
So uh, if you're wondering at the most basic level, what does Fedora do? Um, this is really it. So Fedora is pretty tightly scoped. Uh, it does five things. Um, and these are those five things. Uh, so, uh, and just a note on how I've assembled this slide. On the left are the features, and I'll, I'll talk briefly about what those are. And on the right are standards. Uh, so we have architected Fedora, and specifically the Fedora API, to provide a very limited set of uh, features, and all of those features are tied to um, international standards, typically web standards. Uh, the idea being that we really don't want to maintain a bunch of custom stuff. We used to do that in prior versions, uh, and it uh, leaves a lot of technical debt. So uh, in more recent versions of Fedora, we've really focused on uh, adopting modern web standards rather than kind of doing things in a custom way. So the first one, you know, basic resource management, creating, reading, updating, and deleting, uh, something you would obviously expect any repository application to handle. Uh, this is actually all being done in accordance with uh, the linked data platform. So this is a specification that comes out of the World Wide Web Consortium, uh, the W3C, uh, that kind of talks about how clients and servers can interact on the web using linked data. So that is basically, that's the interaction model for how you uh, work with the Fedora API. You can uh, translate RDF back and forth. Um, Fedora also does versioning, uh, so when you make changes to things, you can uh, create versions uh, of those resources. Uh, and this is now uh, aligned with Memento, so this is another modern web standard for being able to uh, hand a server a, a, a date and time and get back a resource as near as possible to that date and time through a kind of time gate uh, uh, paradigm. So Fedora implements that as uh, part of versioning. Uh, authorization, so Fedora doesn't do authentication where you give kind of a username and password that's handled at a layer above, but uh, authorization uh, where uh, users um, basically have permissions to act on certain resources in the repository. Uh, this is all handled by another uh, web standard called Web Access Control. Um, this again comes out of the W3C uh, and it uses linked data, RDF as a way of uh, making statements about authorization uh, that can be enforced by the, by the server. So, so that's how Fedora handles authorization. Uh, it also does fixity, uh, so you can provide a checksum and f uh, when you put a file into Fedora, it'll store the file, and then you can request back that checksum to compare it against a known value at any time. Uh, and this is all just being done with standard uh, HTTP headers, so uh, digest, want digest headers. Uh, and finally, messaging, I mentioned that earlier, that's the other interaction model other than the, the API uh, where Fedora emits these messages and you can have um, integration software that receives these messages and kicks off workflows. Uh, and this is all being done with um, activity streams as well as linked data notifications. So uh, again, the message here is just Fedora provides this really limited set of features uh, that are useful for building applications. Uh, and uh, all of these are provided through the API with the exception of messaging that's sort of provided um, alongside the API. Uh, and all of these are, are uh, now uh, formally documented in uh, the, the specification, which you can find at that link there, that fedora.info slash spec. So we've spent the last year or more um, uh, writing a formal specification for all of these services to provide some stability for clients and to actually cleanly separate the Fedora API from the underlying software that's, that, uh, that actually implements that API. Um, so uh, this uh, it wasn't originally part of this, uh, this presentation, but just because the, the timing happens to line up, I wanted to mention this, that the, the proposed recommendation for that specification is now available. Uh, if you have an interest in specifications, and specifically those related to uh, linked data and web standards, I, I would encourage you to read it. Uh, and it, it, there is still some time for comment, although the, the dust is largely settled. Uh, and so we, we plan to formally publish that specification um, this year. Uh, at the same time, we are releasing a 5.0 version of Fedora, and I won't go into a lot of detail here, but those of you that may have been following Fedora development as it's gone through version 3 and version 4 and now version 5 may feel some anxiety to see version 5.0 up on the screen here, so I just want to assure you that uh, the change between version 3 and 4 was very large, the change between version 4 and 5 is very small. Uh, basically what we did was we took this as an opportunity to convert to using standard semantic versioning rather than what we were doing before, which was using version 4 as a kind of marketing tool and, and, and never incrementing that first digit of the version. So uh, 5.0 is equivalent to what we would have called 4.8. Uh, it, it has some breaking API changes, but the software is basically the same. So hopefully that uh, puts some minds at ease about the scope of the changes. Largely, it represents bringing the software into alignment with the new specification. So we'll have a 1.0 of the API spec and a 5.0 of the software. 
Uh, and I mentioned uh, integration patterns. So we use a project from the Apache Foundation called Camel. It's quite useful. Uh, I won't go into a lot of detail about Camel, but uh, it uh, basically is middleware for handling asynchronous workflows. And this is what we use to receive the messages that Fedora emits and uh, do useful things. Uh, so one of those might be uh, updating an external index so Fedora doesn't have a built-in search endpoint because uh, we don't want to maintain one. There are better ones out there like Solar and, and, and Elasticsearch, so let's just use those. Uh, Fedora uh, emits messages and Camel picks those up and updates the index. So you don't have to write code for this. This tooling already exists. Uh, the same is true for triple store, so Fedora doesn't have a built-in triple store, uh, but there's lots of great triple stores out there, uh, so you can set up any one that you want, uh, and we have workflows already set up to update that index, uh, which is nice, because if down the road a better triple store emerges, you can just start using that one and do a re-indexing operation to update it. You don't have to worry about having something built into Fedora. Oh, something seems to have failed here. Uh, oh. Yeah, Okay. Great. Uh, and so we've, we've tested a few of these, but uh, this is all basically kind of working software. Um, okay, so that, that's a little bit about Fedora. Uh, I wanted to kind of build on that to talk more about Islandora Claw. So Islandora, uh, I haven't heard at this conference, well, last year was my first conference at, at SWIB. I, I didn't hear uh, anyone talking about Islandora. Sambera gets discussed sometimes, but uh, I really wanted to talk about the work that Islandora is doing as a community because it, it aligns very well with the kind of patterns I was just discussing with Fedora, and there are people in the community that are already using Islandora to build uh, kind of linked data applications. So I, I wanted to talk about it a little bit. Um, so if you're not familiar with Islandora, uh, it is uh, basically a set of collection of Drupal modules that uh, is built on top of Fedora. So it combines Drupal and Fedora and Solar to, to build a complete system. Uh, Fedora doesn't really have a built-in user interface, at least not one that you would want to show the public. Uh, so Islandora basically provides the kind of nice, shiny website on top of Fedora uh, because everything's kind of modular. Um, so it's a really nice system. Uh, it actually comes from uh, Prince Edward Island in Canada, which is very near where I live. Uh, and uh, people are often surprised that such a uh, big project comes out of such a small place. It's the smallest province in the country. Um, but there's a lot of really good work going on there. Um, they really like mascots. Um, lobsters are uh, quite popular in uh, Atlantic Canada. Um, we have a lot of them. They're pretty tasty. Uh, and so Claw is really just a code name for the newest version of Islandora. This will become the mainline version quite soon. Um, but since they've been re-architecting the project, uh, and the community manager, Melissa Anes, uh, from whom I uh, politely stole these slides, um, really uh, does a great job at uh, uh, drawing these, these fun mascots, uh, in addition to all the other great work she does. Um, so uh, at, at its most basic level, the, wow, okay, I'm not really sure what's going on here, but maybe I can just close this window. Okay, yeah, it keeps... So uh, this is just kind of a list of components. Uh, Islandora, the, the newest version of it is based on Drupal 8. So Drupal is a very well-known platform for building websites. Uh, it integrates Solar, uh, Fedora 4, and soon to be 5.0. So they're testing the, the 5.0 release candidate now. Uh, has a set of modules. It uses Apache Camel. So again, following the same paradigms that we follow in architecting Fedora, uh, and a series of connectors and microservices and configuration files. So very much in alignment with how we're doing things uh, on the Fedora project. Uh, I won't go into detail on this slide. This is just meant to kind of illustrate how the Islandora framework is sort of um, applying a modular approach. So you have kind of the administrative interface on one side with Drupal and, and its components. You have a series of connectors that do things like uh, index to a triple store. Um, and you have the repository over on the right-hand side. So that's Fedora, but also a, a triple store that they're indexing to. Uh, and then a series of microservices. And there are typically HTTP interactions, sometimes JMS messaging interactions uh, between these components. And I have a, another workflow slide later on that illustrates how a specific project is making use of this. Um, and, and that's kind of what I wanted to talk about here is just one uh, example use case of how so, uh, uh, an institution is currently using this new Islandora software to do some, uh, some work with uh, repository stuff, but also with some linked data stuff. Um, so this comes out of the uh, University of Toronto Scarborough Library, the digital scholarship unit there. Um, there's a research project. Uh, they're collaborating with uh, Professor uh, Natalie Rothman on this uh, Dragoman Renaissance research platform. Uh, so the Dragomans were these uh, kind of interpreter translators operating between the 15 and 1700s. Uh, and they've had this kind of sort of 15-year-old research project where they have 
basically three types of things. They have the, the people themselves, uh, these artifacts represented by um, this, this uh, uh, thing in the middle here, uh, and then documents, kind of full text. So, uh, and, uh, so, so that's kind of what they're working with. Uh, and they've decided uh, to use Island or a Claw to kind of build a platform for researchers to use to interact with that scholarship. Uh, first by doing some ontology development work and then implementing this in this new Island or a Claw software, uh, followed by doing some data migration, some refinement, and, and finally exposing that data for, uh, for analysis. So that's kind of what their, their workflow is like. Um, they chose this new version of Islandora primarily because they were very interested in using linked data for this purpose. Uh, they already had some existing skills and ex expertise. They've been using Islandora for some time at that institution. Uh, they really wanted to leverage some of the content modeling features that both Fedora and Drupal provide, as well as some of the nice kind of visual uh, interface elements. Drupal has a, a module called Views that is quite useful for presenting information uh, that has a lot of flexibility as well as um, some good search integration. Uh, and they really, this was a, a, a prototype, so they wanted to do some experimentation with some of the new modules that, that Drupal 8 makes available. So this is just kind of a really basic workflow diagram for how their work progresses. So if a user is kind of interacting with the repository, uh, they start out by creating a node in Drupal. This is just sort of the basic um, uh, element of, of a Drupal uh, website. Uh, and then some kind of workflow processes kick off. So, uh, there's a process that runs an index to Solar, so that Solar gets updated with that information. But they're also using something called Drupal Rules, which is another Drupal module, to kind of uh, send some messages through a message broker. ActiveMQ is a message broker. Uh, and then they have these services that run. So they do kind of a, uh, uh, they have a, an application uh, that, called Alpaca that picks up the message and sends it off to a microservice. Uh, but it also uh, runs a Sparkle update processor to update BlazeGraph, which they're using now. They, they may use a different triple store in the future. The nice part is these parts are all swappable. Um, they have an, another component called Milner that then creates the resource in Fedora and a component called Gemini that does path mapping so they can synchronize the content in Drupal with the content in Fedora. Um, so that's just basically what their, what their workflow looks like. Uh, so they implemented this in, in Claw. They, they did some co content modeling work, taking the classes and taxonomies and mapping those onto content types. Uh, using views to show some of the related content, uh, doing some search configuration for faceting. Uh, Drupal has some nice RDF capabilities now, so doing some RDF mapping, and et cetera. Um, so in terms of visually, it's, it's quite simple, but this is um, when you look at one of the resources here, um, you, you get um, a number of links uh, to, other, uh, uh, to other elements within the, the, the repository. Uh, but the underlying structure here, you can basically get uh, JSON-LD representations of all of these things. So they are actually doing linked data under the covers, um, it, even though on the surface it just kind of looks like a standard website. Uh, and they are, of course, uh, indexing this to an external triple store, in this case, BlazeGraph, so that you can do some querying. Uh, and then they had some fun with uh, an application called Palladio that I, I believe comes out of Stanford uh, to be able to kind of visualize the content that they were getting out of the, the triple store uh, to enable some other kind of research analysis that, uh, that was going on there. Um, so this is really just a prototype. This is something they've started to work on, but they're very interested in interoperability. Uh, you know, as was discussed in the keynote, it's, it's great that they're publishing linked data, but they haven't yet achieved the step of combining their linked data with other linked data that's out in the world. They'd really like to do that, as well as adding some flexible scholarship tools and trying to speed up deployment and make this kind of easier to, to bring researchers into this without having to know a whole lot about linked data uh, to start with. Uh, so I wanted to conclude here just by talking a little bit about um, how these projects are supported and maintained. There's lots of free open source software out there, but not all of it um, continues to be supported in the long term. Uh, so we uh, have a model where Aerospace is, is a not-for-profit. The Islandora Foundation is a sep its own separate not-for-profit entity. And these are all community-supported entities. So uh, institutions from around the world uh, fund us on an annual basis that allows us to have full-time staff working. Uh, travel like this to, to come and do presentations and, and workshops and training. Um, so we've been trying to expand our, our membership base. So we have uh, 75 members right now from around the world. It's a little bit North America heavy, but actually this year we added uh, eight new members, none of whom were from the United States. So that was really nice. Uh, most of whom are from this region uh, in Europe. So um, if you're on the list, thank you. This is how we support and sustain this project in the long term. Uh, if you use Fedora uh, and you're not yet a member, I'd really encourage you to join at whatever level is sustainable for you. It's, this is just how we make sure that these projects stay around for, for the long term. Uh, Islandora is very similar, so they do a lot of great work. They have their own foundation. If you're using Islandora, I'd encourage you to become a, a member of their foundation as well. 
Um, and I did want to just mention, there are some links here. Uh, I proposed a, a user group meeting for Fedora during the breakout at this conference. Uh, and it's in the Etherpad notes. So uh, if you're interested in just kind of meeting up, uh, whether you're a current user or a potential user, uh, to kind of get together and meet others in the region that might be using the software, uh, ask questions and, and have any kind of discussion, uh, feel free to sign up for that. If we get enough people interested, hopefully we can hold a, uh, a breakout session. But uh, I will stop there. And I think we probably have a little bit of time for questions. So thank you. Thank you so much, David. That was fantastic. Um, we have a couple minutes for questions. Do you folks have questions for David? Questions, questions? Maybe not. <laughs> so I'll ask. Um, one of the biggest uh, community discussion points that we've had around Fedora and Fedora 4 has been scalability. Mm -hmm. And I know that you guys have done a lot of work on that. Can you say where that is with the LDP implementation that you guys have? Yeah. Uh, so scale is obviously very important. Uh, and there are lots of different requirements around scale. Uh, it's kind of a vague term. Uh, and, and you know it's important to talk about whether we're talking about scale for uh, you know read access or ingest performance or failover. There's lots of different contexts here. Um, one of the things that the uh, API specification that I talked about enables uh, is, and I, I alluded to this, but um, it allows you to uh, uh, change out the underlying software that actually supports the API. So right now we're using a project called Mode Shape. It's an open source project. Uh, it works very well for some use cases, but one thing that it isn't really designed to do is kind of massive horizontal scalability. But there are lots of other software applications out there that uh, are focused more on that use case. Uh, and we have a few of them in the community right now. Uh, there's a project called Drastic that I think is out of the University of Maryland in the United States, uh, and another called Trellis. Uh, and actually, these are being uh, uh, most, more or less the same thing at this point. Um, they're very focused on uh, scale as a use case. Uh, but they're all, all of these and other implementations are, are still going to be uh, versions of Fedora. So from a client perspective, it all looks the same because you're all interacting with the Fedora API, but under the hood, you can actually have a different um, kind of storage and preservation layer. So I think that's the primary way that we'll address this. There are limits to the scalability of something like Mode Shape, but uh, these newer uh, uh, you know, uh, implementations, I think, are going to uh, unlock a lot of potential specifically for institutions that are interested in things like you know, massive horizontal yeah. scale and computation and things like that. Great. Thank you. And I'm excited to hear about Chalice. Um, other questions?